right, so we now want to transition to a, to a time of, as we talked about, talking about racial intelligence, about racial rec reconciliation, uh, the church, and, uh, and what this means for all of us in our individual lives. So first, let me introduce you to our panel. Uh, we have here Dr. John Perkins, uh, who... He, he, I mean, he needs no introduction, but he is a civil rights leader. He's a pastor, a founder of the uh, Christian uh, Community Development Association. He has seven honorary doctorates, and he is a, a, a leader and a trailblazer. We, we'd be remiss to have this, this, this discussion without him. We also have Helen Lee. Helen is a writer and a journalist. Uh, she's also the author of, well, she's the author of several books, but she is uh, most recently the author of A Missional Mom. Um, uh, she has a BA in bioethics from Williams College, an MA from Wheaton, and an MBA from Babson College with focus on entrepreneurship. Uh, we also have Jorge Mendoza, who is the lead pastor of Emmaus Church in, in San Jose. He's married to Wendy, has four daughters, and he is a graduate of the Cornerstone Seminary and is currently pursuing a, a research master's in ethics, culture, and theology at Southeastern Seminary. We have Stu, who, you guys know Stu. He's a mad scientist and the founder of Verge, um, and also a pastor and elder at the Austin Stone. Uh, and last, we have uh, Deuce Branch, who's a Christian rapper, uh, a speaker, church planter, a husband, and a father. Uh, he and his family just moved from Philly to South Carolina uh, so that he, um, he could pursue a PhD at Southeastern. Um, and he also has a master's in theology at, uh, from Dow Seminary. Um, so, Dr. Perkins, we want to we want to start the discussion uh, with you, and and really want to ask the question. You have been a part of this work for many many years, and you have seen um, you've seen a lot. And so, we kind of I want to pose the question to you: Where where are we now in the context of where we've been? Let me make a statement. You re-asked the question. Uh, the, 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 the joy, joy is um, sort of a realization of long-time expectation. And I come here tonight with uh, at least 53 years of expectation and longing for this kind of uh, discussion. So this is a, a, a great fulfillment. And what Verge is doing and what uh, we are doing, you are doing in terms of planting these multicultural churches around the world is I think the seed for us to fulfill that whole idea of let justice roll down like water and righteous as a matter of stream. So I'm just honored and honored that you folks are here and I can be with you. Restate the question. <laughs> Thanks for that. So, so the question is, where, where are we now in the context of where we've been? <laughs> we, 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 are, we are right now at a pivot moment and we can't allow this moment to pass us. There is a new humanity being born. Mm. It's the first time in my 83 years that I see people who see value in diversity. That's the world, that's the internet. Uh, and so we, we are at a, uh, I think it's Isaiah or Jeremiah would say, Jeremiah would say we are like bringing a woman in labor and we are coming right to the birth and do we have the strength to deliver, or will we stay still bond, still bond. This is a moment uh, in history. I don't think we can go back from it. I sort of feel that it's God's moment uh, for us. We had a great uh, statement of beginning. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all human beings are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain rights, chief among those are life, liberty, 
and the pursuit of happiness. We fail it. I think we are that generation that could make that a reality. Mm. That should make us mm. feel a sense of absolute significance. Mm. And then the rest mm. of it ought to be doing justice and trying to walk in humility. I think we, we at a moment, we've come a long, long way. Uh, and it, 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 it haven't been uh, so much the church because the church could have done that from the beginning because that was the mission. Love and justice was God's motivation for redemption. And you can't separate love from justice. Uh, and, 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 but we removed it. I think the first slave ship did damage to it. And, and, and our nation itself have not, even after the war, civil war, that we haven't really affirmed it. And I think the political fuss we have is still trying to do it without affirming uh, this, our creed. And, and, and if we would be the generation would claim that, that we are, and we are not rebellious. We, we, are, we are living up to the statement that our creed is on. We have the rights to do this uh, uh, in, in society. And so uh, we've come a long way, uh, but we, we are at a pivot point. I don't exactly know what will happen if we go back. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mm -hmm. know what will happen to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Stu, we've talked a lot about, um, about as we've been talking about this panel and preparing for this panel in the context of the theme, Redeem to Redeem, do you, you think that it's fair to call this a gospel issue, racial, racial reconciliation? A absolutely. You know, you, you can't be around Dr. Perkins for more than a few minutes and not hear him um, encourage and challenge us with something that is true about us. And it's this, that, that God was in Christ reconciling us to himself. It's, I, I, I even feel like, like I can hear your, 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 your encouragement, your challenge, and your, your, your dream for us that God was in Christ reconciling us. And he didn't just stop right there, but he made us uh, reconcilers. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And so when we talk about redeem to redeem, we could have very easily said we've been reconciled to reconcile. Mm -hmm. And reconcile means make it right. That mm -hmm. what's, what was wrong, we make right. What was, what was broken, we make right. And that's what it means to reconcile, whether that's uh, in, in an area of justice or racial uh, reconciliation or, or whatever that is. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a gospel issue. You know, when, when uh, in Galatians 2, when, when Paul uh, rebuked Peter. Uh, he rebuked him for being a racist. He said, you, you, you've separated yourself from the Gentiles. There, there's, a, there's a racial segregation that's going on here. It may seem comfortable to you, Peter, because now you're with your own people and you can talk your own language and you have your own customs. It may seem comfortable. You may be pursuing comfort, but it's still a, a racist thing that you're doing. And Paul says something very, very important there. He says, he says, he he, he challenged him to his face, and he said, Peter, you're not living in line with the truth of the gospel. It is a gospel issue. And you know, in that, in that whole God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, in that whole passage, he warns us, he says, and that's the last of the text, receive not this grace of God in vain. Uh, uh, the, the idea was that God has made us reconcilers. And if we don't become those reconcilers, we have received God's grace in vain. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's the mission, and I think we're finding it. We're finding it. I think we're trapped in issues, and there's something bigger than our issues. I think justice is bigger than our issues. And now we are we're caught into our issue, uh, homosexuality, uh, abortion, and all of those are important issues, but there is something bigger than that. And if we give our bigger to that, then we would be able to solve some of those uh, issues. But we haven't given ourselves to what is justice. Uh, justice is primarily a stewardship 
economic issue. It's stood in the creation. And the Bible is about the student of it. And the student of it is not with absolute economic equality. It's with economic opportunity to work and to be creative in our, in, in our world. Mm -hmm. and, the, and that would be the reflection of just, and we haven't decided that it's an economic issue. Yeah, racism is, is a gospel issue because the gospel reconciles not only sinners to God, but the gospel reconciles us to one another. Romans 5.1, we have peace with God through the gospel. Ephesians 2, he is our peace between us, um, Jew and Gentile, believer between believers. So it's, all, it's not only a gospel expression issue, I think it's also a gospel extension issue, um, how the gospel goes out. I was, by the time I was about 13, 14 years old, I had made a conscious decision that I didn't want anything to do with the gospel. Why? Because I started reading history. And I started reading Mexican history in particular and learned about the colonization of the Americas. And I discovered what was going on there, what had happened. And I said, man, if that's Christianity, if that's the gospel, I don't want anything at all to do with that. And I spent a number of years just rejecting, actively rejecting it. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, people loved me with the gospel and showed me, showed me what the gospel was really about. But there are people in your schools and your neighborhoods that have similar experience. For whatever, it, it, maybe it's not that, but it's another issue related to that. Maybe that they have made a conscious decision man, because of a bad representation of what they thought the gospel was. They said, I don't, want, I don't even want to hear it. So it's uh, expression of the gospel issue and extension of the gospel issue as well. If I could just add on to what Jorge has said, and I think that what happens is we really sacrifice the integrity of the gospel when there is not unity in love in the church. And so when people who are non-believers, particularly non-believers of color, see the church and see the disharmony, see the disunity, see that what we say about loving one another in Christ is not borne out in how we treat one another, then the gospel becomes irrelevant to them. They think you talk about the gospel, but you're not living it out. It doesn't mean anything. So I think that we have to be careful as the church to make sure we are truly pursuing this idea of unity and love, living it out, love and justice both hand in hand, because if we don't demonstrate that in how we live, that truly does hamper the entire integrity of the gospel. And it bears witness to what, what you were just talking about, Jorge, where people will say, I don't want anything to do with that Christianity, that religion, because that doesn't mean anything. Those words like love and unity don't mean anything. We talked about in, in introducing the session tonight, the, we talked about Dr. King's quote that Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the week. Um, is, that still, is that still true? Yes, I would think so, uh, because we are we, we are pretty well we are pretty well somewhat integrated, even by law, in the workplace. Uh, those little things like affirmative action and those things have worked somewhat, but uh, it is the uh, church who ought to be the believer of this truth that from one blood, one race, created he all peoples to dwell upon this earth. And Jesus says, I am your peace. I want you, I have made provision for us to become one. And in this body, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free. So it's a church real problem more than a government problem. And if we have in history, as we come along, uh, the last deal in terms of our nation getting rid of apartheid in the world was the Dutch Reformed Church in Africa, South Africa. In Mississippi, it was the Baptists. And uh, we could have went to Louisiana, it would have been the Catholics. The, you know, they're the ones who held the cap on it. It couldn't exist. You, you, you know, so your idea, what we're doing here is for the integrity of the gospel. He, that's his idea. He didn't believe because the gospel did not have integrity. And so this is 
for our own integrity, for our existence, for us to proclaim that there is a creative God that created this humanity to bear his face in the world. And, and, and injustice is spitting in the face of this image of God in society. So it's, it's the church. It's the church. And that's what thrills me uh, uh, about, to, about the church. And we got to bring it back to the church, and I'm seeing a glimpse of that. This night, to me, is a glimpse of that. You know, Dr. Perkins, one of, one, you know, even off of that, one of the questions that I always get is, is, is race even an, an issue now? I mean, we've got all these laws that have kind of taken care of everything. To, you know, it, the hidden question is, it, it, didn't the civil rights movement kind of erase hundreds of years of oppression? You know, didn't we kind of hit the reset button in the civil rights movement? I mean, we've got all these just laws now um, that, that, that are working towards, um, you know, uh, racial justice. So, so aren't we good now? You know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a question I always hear. And, and, and I, I think the best way, especially as a, as, a, as a white person to white people, I think the best way to, to understand it is kind of with this, uh, this analogy. This has really helped me understand it. It's, it's a, a, as if our families were playing Monopoly together. And so let's say you, you and I sit down, we're, we're, we're playing Monopoly together. In fact, uh, my grandfather and your grandfather sit down. You know, Monopoly games take about three hours or so. And so we're sitting down, we're playing Monopoly, and my grandfather's playing with your grandfather, and your grandfather passes go, and my grandfather hits him in the face and take, takes his $200. Seriously. And then that goes on for about an hour. Every time your grandfather passes go, my grandfather hits him in the face and takes his $200. And then my dad and your dad come to the table, and my dad says, hey, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry that my, you know, your grandfather hit you in the face and took your money. We're, we're, we're going to play by the rules now, okay? Is that, is that fair? Well, let's, let's play by the rules. So they start playing. So my dad and your dad are playing Monopoly, and they're going on, on their way, and your dad starts to save up a little money, and he starts to land on some good squares, and all of a sudden, he's buying Marvin Gardens. And that makes my dad nervous. So my dad says, wait, 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 wait a second. Um, I, I know you bought Marvin Gardens, but... Um, we're, we're, you actually can't have Marvin Gardens. So we're going to put that back in the bank, and, uh, and, and we're going to... You, you can buy uh, Connecticut Avenue. You know, the, 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 the pieces on that side of the board, the, the, the light blue and purple ones, right? And, and, and I'll buy the ones on this side of the board. And, 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 you know, I'm sorry my grandfather, you know, had his issues, but we'll, we'll play this way and go on. And your dad's sitting there going, well, I, I can't do anything about it. He owns a bank. So then they're playing, and I can't, does my dad uh, pay you back? Does he, he says, I'm sorry, but does he pay you back? No, he doesn't. They keep playing. So they keep playing. And uh, my dad is able to accrue quite a bit of money and, uh, and wealth and access and power. He's got houses and hotels he's built up on this side of the board. And all of a sudden, every time your dad hits that square, he gets hit with a crazy amount of rent every time he goes around the board. And I come to the table, and you come to the table, and we're like, okay, let's play now. And I, and, and I say, you know what? This isn't fair. You're not able to, to buy pieces on this side of the board. That's not what the rules say. That, that, that's not at all what the rules say. We're, we're going to play uh, by the rules now. Uh, um, e even though I've got all the access and all the wealth that I've accumulated over generations, uh, uh, um, we're going to play by the, the rule rules now, right? So, so then... Do I apologize for my grandfather hitting your grandfather in the face and taking his money? Dude, that was like three hours ago. Why, why do we got to keep talking about that? Do, do I give you the money back that I've taken from you over generation after generation after generation that I've taken from you unjustly? Do I give it back to you? I mean, come on. What are we? Communists? This is America. We're not communists. We're capitalists. We serve King Capitalism, not King Jesus. No, 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 no. No, we're just going to start playing by the rules now. Okay? And here's the crazy thing. Here's the crazy thing. The crazy thing is that white people get mad about affirmative action as if the Monopoly game was wiped clean, right? And we started over, not still skewed and weighted towards white people and as if lazy whites never clogged up the system, so, uh, and, and all the while minorities were overpassed, brilliant, hardworking minorities were overpassed, and then we get mad 
when certain when affirmative action happens, or or we say, hey, fine, um, you, you know, you know, we'll say something like certain minorities take the two hundred dollars, take Baltic Avenue, they make do something amazing with with it, and and we say as as whites in America, we say, hey, look, see, the system's fair. He was able to do something with that, all the while ignoring the fact that the whole monopoly game is skewed to one group of people. We are completely ignorant of the fact that it's not fair. And we're ignorant of the fact that that is our history, whether we like it or not, summed up in a board game. That is our history, and that is the way that things are and that is the way and why things are that they are today. So what, what I want to say as a white person to white people, the monopoly game is skewed in our favor. It's called privilege. It's called white privilege. Privilege that you did not earn and you did not deserve. Privilege that was gained literally on the backs of unjust laws and a system that was tilted in favor of the balance of power and money and wealth and access and everything else to whites. So no, we're not over the race thing yet. We've got a long way to go. This is great. This is great. Uh, let me see, can I illustrate the two questions? We elected Obama. Uh, and he says that there are 40 million Americans that don't have health care. We're going to do a good capitalistic deal. We're going to have everybody to buy health care. Every European white nation on earth has national socialized health care, and Obama was going to make one that was capitalistic. You got to buy your own insurance. Now, Obamacare now is evil that every other nation has it. I have a damage of our racism and our privilege. Uh, it, it, it only takes incidents. We are so damaged. We are damaged too now, okay? We blacks are damaged too. You, you know, we all are damaged. We all have sinned equally in society. But, but we're talking now about the church, and we're trying to talk beyond our race. We're trying to talk about what would a society look like. Jesus gave more attention to healing the sick than he did to anything else. We as Christians. And now we got a capitalistic one. You got to buy your insurance. You got to buy your insurance. Obama ain't giving you no insurance. He's building a big pool. Somehow, all the other white nations are socialists, and we are the only democracy. Do you see there's holes in our charity? There are holes in our charity in, in, in our society. So the church has got to take responsibility for that. It's our work to be confronting and speaking truth that is healing. We got the good news of God's love for the humanity. We have been loved. We have been redeemed. And he got us as the redeemers carrying his message of redemption to the world. We're at a moment. We're at a moment. The past is important. You got to live with a sort of within the Trinity. You got to understand the past. We got to look at the present and then we got to be living for the future in our society. And I think we're at that moment that we can bring that together. Can I just say something? Um, amen. And um, <laughs> amen. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm reminded of the fact that great people, after years and years and years of having grown either calloused or numb um, to what clearly the gospel exposes as a gospel issue, as a sin issue, uh, need divine intervention in order to break the cycle. Yes. Uh, I was thinking about Peter who needed a sheet to be dropped as he was hungry and God 
chose to remind him again that that he is going to break this idea of someone is inferior to someone, someone has less access to God as someone, someone deserves something more than someone else. He had to drop a sheet down and prepare him for the Cornelius experience so that then Peter could be a minister of the gospel and an advocate and an affirmer. And several times after that, Peter had to stand up and say, oh, God had to correct me and my understanding of how the Gentiles are like everyone else. People who have access and availability to God equally. Paul picked the same thing up. Hey, all of us, we come in the same way. We've all been shut up under sin to prove that all of us are guilty. All of us have to be freely justified by his grace. So once again, right now, I'm just mindful of the fact that it's going to take God. We may try to have humanly engineered strategies for how we do it. And amen. If that is a fruit of repentance, I'm going to seek. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus just did what he, you know, he, he, he knew. He said, hey, I, I know about reprobations. I know about trying to give back. I want to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And, uh, and so one of the things that we do is I think people are putting a good step forward. Uh, my school right now, Southeastern, they attest to their checkered past and their explicit racism in the past. And they say, we say sorry all day. We understand it's skewed. We understand that we're benefited. So we want to begin to at least make some good faith, evident shoe leather uh, attempts to let you know that we plan on doing something different in the past, even though, I mean, in the future, even though we can't change the past. So may God give us grace to apply ourselves to concrete gospel initiatives going forward while we acknowledge the past yes, yes. and trust Christ as we proceed to the future. Amen. So I think for I think for a lot of this, all of this is, you know, is is perhaps kind of overwhelming. You know, we we may be confronted with past that we didn't have control over, we may become aware of the fact that we benefit from things that, that, um, that came before us. But what, it, what, is it, what does it look like for the church to come together? Not, not necessarily on a macro level or on a policy level, but is a, one human being interacting with another human being. What does it look like for us to reconcile, to come together? Uh, just real quickly, uh, you know, as a the whole Monopoly game illustration is a, if you've never had to address that, that's a hard one to address as a white person. And so I, I do want to say, let's remember the gospel in this. Um, nobody needs to be motivated by fear or pride or guilt or shame in any of this. Um, but I think there's something very important for us that I think the first thing, I, I was sitting backstage with propaganda and I said, if, if, if you could say, one thing to white people about white privilege, what would you say? And he said, you know, I would just say, just acknowledge it. Just acknowledge that the, the board game has been skewed, the power and the access and the accumulation of wealth and the opportunity. He was like, I got 19 aunts and uncles and nobody paid for my wedding. He said, my white, my white brother, he, uh, I said, how did you, how did you, Float such an awesome wedding," he said. "My wife's dad. The, the, even today, it's we're still in a generation where things are skewed in that way. And for us to acknowledge and say, yes, there is an issue here of access. There is an issue of power um, from a racial perspective. There is an issue where um, it's skewed that way. I think we can then move on to other steps by the power of the grace of God, motivated by the gospel, knowing that we're sons and daughters. We can then take steps forward when we see that there is a problem to take steps forward with. Absolutely. I think, to add to that, I think um, why that acknowledgement is important, like you see examples of the Old Testament where like Nehemiah, man, we and our fathers have sinned. We have disobeyed the covenant. And he's talking about generations ago, yet he includes himself in that sin That's and good. confesses it. That's good. And he let, he's letting God know that he's aware of the sins. He's aware of the unfaithfulness to the past. And I think by people today confessing and identifying with, man, yeah, that was wrong. We, we identify, we confess it. 
and lets the minority population around you feel comfortable and not apprehensive like, oh, they still don't get it. But by acknowledging it today, it gives a confidence in others that, oh, yeah, they get it and they want to do something different about it. Mm -hmm. I will say, um, you know, talking about com coming together, I would never um, um, act like I know anything nearly close to what um, Dr. Perkins was saying. When he says it's still the most segregated uh, day, um, you know, generationally you sense it or see it differently in terms of your, your ability to attest to it. Um, and we live in an era where there are generations, mine and forward, like younger, who the world's never been more eclectic. And I think, oh, excuse me, and I think he uh, even admitted that. He said, oh man, the age of the internet and globalization and everything, it, it, like there's a sense in which we have more access to be more integrated than we ever have. And so I think really what we're saying is, I think you're seeing it. We just had an unconference like similar to what we're having here. And if somebody would have dropped in, heard us talking about the excellencies of Christ, heard us hashing through our own deficiencies in just being regularly engaged in racial reconciliation and living it out, they might have been blown away. And then when they looked around and saw it, they were like, how did this happen? And then we were asking each other, yeah, how did this happen? And so we just need to be uh, at least, um, uh, we have to continue to encourage each other that we sh it shouldn't take a conference like this with the bells and whistles to do what we can do in our own communities and around our own kitchen you know, tables. This is what we should do. Fill our homes with that diverse group of people and continue to hash and continue to pray and continue to uh, work toward this, this, this end that we want to see and that is Christ glorified through the multiplicity of ethnicities and cultures and values uh, showing off for his glory. Yeah, what it should look like. What it should look like, we should see, we don't quite see right. racism as sin. We see it as a social problem mm. Mm. in our society. If we could see it, and it causes more war and more death and more poverty than anything else. All of the walls, the one that's going on now in Russia is an ethnic wall. Hitler's Second yeah. World War was an ethnic war. Death, it, genocide is a mad killer uh, in our world. But we don't see it, we see it as a, a, a social thing. We're gonna drink coffee and sell it. We're gonna, it's, it's wicked, it's sinful. And what it looks like if my people, God's church, his people, that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from our wicked, not a social sin, but wicked oppression and death, exploitation, uh, exploiting the children we heard tonight. That's for us men to have access to these young children mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in our world and turn from my wicked ways, mm -hmm. then God says, I will hear you from heaven and I forgive your sin and heal your land. And what I'm learning now, and, and Paul struggled with that, God brings all of his love to us when we confess our sin. He bring it all home. He can be no more than faithful and just. That's his name. And when Paul saw the redemptive the forgiveness of sin as being so powerful, he raised the question, shouldn't I keep on sinning in order I can feel this nearness of God in my life? Mm. Th this is a plea away from our own addiction. This is a plea. We think we're going to lose something if we practice equality. We're going to enrich the world. We're going to enrich the world. Mm -hmm. we, you are taken from me. That's why we don't see, that, see it as an economic issue. You think that I'm going to le lose profit margin. Mm -hmm. I'm going to lose this. Mm -hmm. uh, if I pay mm -hmm. people a livable wage, mm -hmm. somehow or another, 
uh, we always have passed it on to the customers anyway. That's what competition is about. And somehow or another, we do that for the poor. We are doing something very sinful in, in this world. We don't believe, we don't believe in justice. But we talk about a just society. Of course, that's the end of reconciliation, that we might live in peace, that we might love each other.